Hey fellow photographers, happy Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day. I'm really curious to see what you guys are going to photograph and how you're going to photograph it. What kind of pinhole camera are you going to use? Did you buy one? Did you make one? I really want to know. But I also want to talk about something else. See, most people think pinhole cameras are pretty simple, right? Some sort of lightproof box with a pinhole on one side and a way to either have film or digital, something to capture the image on the other side. But it doesn't have to be that way. When you think about pinhole cameras, you usually think about fixed focal lengths, but today I'm going to go over a unique way where you can make a pinhole camera that has a zoom. So here's a really unique way to create a pinhole camera that actually has a zoom function. So I'm going to show you this camera here. And essentially all this is, and this works for you know, most model cameras, is a camera, some sort of film or digital camera. And then what we have here is a bellows. So this bellows can rack in and out. And what are these usually used for? This is used for macro photography. So essentially by changing sort of the distance between whatever lens you put on here and the focal plane, you're allowed to get closer. So by extending the distance, the flange distance, you can actually decrease the minimum focus distance of most lenses. Now, this is usually used for macro photography, but it has an added advantage because what we can do with our pinholes, and especially those body cap pinholes that a lot of people like to make, is that we can use this to effectively change the focal length on the fly of our pinhole cameras. So, for example, this bellows extension ranges from about 70 millimeters on the short side, so we can rack it all the way in here to about 70 millimeters additional to the, flange, to the flange distance of the camera, all the way out to about 200 millimeters. Now, if you don't have a bellows extension, you can also use extension tubes, right? So we have these individual tubes that you can actually attach, and you can even attach these on top of the bellows extension. So you can use extension tubes to get different focal lengths, but it's really cool to have this one unique thing that just can actually change focal lengths on the fly. Now I actually use this bellows extension and varying focal lengths to do something else. I actually created a scientific test that actually tests the hypothesis of that model of optimal pinhole design, which I can link here. Now that video is pretty dense and a lot of people will get lost in the math, but I actually used this in order to test that theory and actually I think the results are going to surprise you. So make sure you stay towards the end of the video to check out those results. But first, let's go over what am I talking about when I talk about this bellows extension. Now remember, wherever we place the pinhole, as far as the, you know, as far away from the film plane, as far as we place that pinhole, that is essentially the focal distance of the pinhole, or the equivalent focal length for that lens. It's not really a lens, right? But we can, we can think of it as some sort of optical focusing device, because we're using a small hole to make an image. Now, what's important to note is that whenever you have a bellows extension, you still have to take into account the flange distance of the camera. So for example, in this Hasselblad, the, the distance between the film plane and the front, where essentially lens mount, where the lens attaches, is 74.9 millimeters. So that's the flange distance. So we take the flange distance, and then we have to add any of the bellows extension. So like I said before, the minimum bellows extension for this camera is right around 70. So the smallest focal length that we can get around here is about 145, roughly, 145 millimeter focal length. And then we can, of course, rack this out all the way to 200, which would be sort of like a 275 millimeter lens. So you can see by using this bellows extension, you can get a wide range of focal lengths for any camera that you can attach a bellows extension to. So where do you find these? You know, you can find these on Ebay's, you know, essentially, you know, search for whatever your camera is. If you have a film camera or like, you know, like Canon, so you search for Canon EF Bellows, so the mount, you usually put the mount name in there, or if you have an older film Canon camera, maybe a Canon FD Bellows. So you search for your manufacturer's name, uh, oftentimes you want to include the lens mount, so this would be a Hasselblad V mount, so this is the V mount Bellows, so Hasselblad Bellows, you know, these are the things that you search for online. Now you may not often see bellows extensions for modern cameras because they're kind of a relic of the past and unless you're doing really serious macro work they're not really you know popular items and they don't really sell a lot of them so you might have to you know look on ebay and find some used stuff especially for the older camera gear and the modern camera gear you might not even find anything in your mount now if you don't can't find a bellows extension like i said the other option is the extension tubes so we can attach extension tubes these are simply fixed focal lengths. So they don't have the zoom feature that this thing does. But essentially you can attach this to 
the lens mount, and then you can create different focal lengths for your pinhole camera. Now, something else that's really important to consider is the actual pinhole size that you use with this zoom. Now, remember that optimal pinhole size is actually dependent upon the focal length that you're using. So you can't necessarily have one optimal pinhole for the entire zoom range. You have to make some sort of compromise and sacrifice. So what optimal pinhole size that may work for a body cap pinhole camera may not be optimal at different stages throughout the zoom range. So how do we go about solving this problem? So I decided to test this problem empirically and actually in doing so I was actually testing the model of optimal pinhole camera design and the optimal pinhole size for any given focal length. So you see what I wanted to do is I wanted to actually test that theory because you know, while you should trust the math and that kind of stuff, empirically, you know, in practice, things might be a little different from a theoretical perfect model. And of course, in practice, it's very hard to get close to perfection. There's always different variables that we have to account for. So in that testing procedure, what I wanted to do is what I wanted to pick a pinhole size that would fall somewhere within this zoom range for the optimum. And then what I wanted to do was take a stepwise set series of pictures at different focal lengths to see what the image would be like. What, was, what would give me the highest and clearest resolution image along the focal range? So what I did was I started with a pinhole size that would theoretically have an optimum value somewhere within this zoom range. It turned out to be around 205 millimeters. But then what I would do is I would take that one pinhole, which is supposed to be optimum at only a certain point in this range, because remember before that range, shorter than that range, is going to be blurry because we're not making a hole small enough to get a clear image. After that range, but beyond the optimum point, diffraction kicks in and we should lose some clarity and sharpness due to the diffracting nature of light. So what I did is I took that pinhole body cap that I made, and it's actually right here in my pocket. So this is the body cap that I made. This is a half millimeter pinhole size. Now this is way too large for a normal body cap and the optimum is about 205 millimeters away from the film plane. But what I did is I stuck it here at, at the body and then I used those extension tubes to put it very distances away and I used this zoom to fine tune exactly where I wanted it and I could set it to the exact optimum theoretically that it should be and then I could even go past that and I can even you know I can even rack this out and go all the way out to 200 millimeters and then even add more and more extension tubes on here to get a super telephoto pinhole camera and all the, all the while I'm looking at the resolution of these images that I've taken on film after scanning them and looking at where, you know, is the optimum actually the optimum? Uh, is it somewhere within the range? And what happens when you go past the optimum? How bad are the effects of diffraction? And to me, the results were actually extremely surprising. See, if you have a pinhole that's too large for your focal length, you have too large of a hole, you do get really, really poor quality images. I mean, you just don't get the, the focus and resolution that, you know, that, that makes any sense because the hole is too large, it's letting in too much light, it's, it's way too soft of an image. But what really surprised me is that when we got to the optimum, yeah, there was a definite stepwise increase in resolution and sort of clarity. But beyond that, you would think that diffraction would take a huge toll on the image quality. And the fact is, it really didn't, not to any noticeable effect. Sure, you could pixel peep and you could say, okay, yeah, it's a little bit softer. But the moral of the story is that having a pinhole that is a certain size, and there's some sort of optimum here, you know, somewhere within this range, Lower than that is much, much worse. Having a focal length that's not optimal in the shorter direction is much, much worse than having a pinhole that's too small for your focal length. So if I rack this all the way out and I have a pinhole that's technically too small, theoretically too small for that focal length, it's actually not as bad as having a pinhole that's too big for that focal length. So always err on the side of making your pinhole smaller. Now before you go making the absolute tiniest pinhole you can for whatever given focal length, remember there are also some drawbacks of making small pinholes. Diffraction is a problem. It, you know, it does create some sort of softness around the image, not as bad as having a pinhole that's too large. But the other problem is having such a tiny pinhole makes a, uh, you know, a large F number, which means that you have very, very, very long exposure times. And if you're not using a digital camera or a film that has good reciprocity characteristics, having that extremely tiny, tiny hole is gonna make your exposure times astronomically long. And you know, part of the fun about going out and taking pictures is going out and taking pictures, not sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting. So there is a comp there is, you know, there's some sort of compromise between the optimal design, erring on the side of too small because diffraction isn't that bad of an issue, but you also have to take the time factor into account. If you're if you're making exposures that take 30 minutes, it's not gonna be a fun experience, especially if you shake the tripod and all of a sudden your you know your image may be ruined. 
you really want to take into account, you want to get close to the optimum, but if you do have to err on the side, err on the side of making the pinhole too small. So that's enough chit chat. Let's actually get into the examples and sort of the testing procedures that I used to prove that the math actually does make quite a bit of sense. So like I said, I took this pinhole camera sort of zoom design and I used it to test a variety of focal lengths with a pinhole, a set size pinhole, in order to sort of test this mathematical theory of where is the optimum trade-off between a pinhole that's small enough to give you a sharp image, but not too small to let diffraction actually degrade the quality of that image. Now, here, here's a picture of me in the studio setting up the, the Hasselblad camera, and I'm setting up this little fake flower thing that I have on, the, on this table here, and I'm measuring out actually two, exactly two meters. So I have the focal plane, um, the film plane of the camera, exactly two meters away from this camera, and that's gonna become important for the calculations. So let's take a look at sort of that calculation. Now, the optical pinhole design video that I have goes into the math a little bit more deeply and how you derive this, but if you don't like the math, then you can actually use this online resource called Wolfram Alpha, which is a sort of computational you know, knowledge thing that essentially can solve math equations for you. And if you buy the you know, premium version, it shows you step by step. So this is a great thing if you ever need help with like math homework or calculus or anything like that. But what I did is I put in the equation. Now remember that this is a half millimeter pinhole, so that's sort of so that's where the 0 0.5 comes from. And then all these other parameters are basically constants or uh, sort of variables that are in the equation. So we have 2.44, and we have sort of the wavelength of light in nanometers. Now everything is converted to millimeters, so everything is in the same units. That's why you see 0 0.00055 millimeters, which is 550 nanometers, which again is that sort of middle of the road green in the visual spectrum. That's what the wavelength of light is. Again, we're solving for F, which is the focal length that is gonna be the optimum. And of course we have one over, now the F over 2000, that's where that comes in. So if you're using you know, a pinhole at infinity, right, that F over the focal distance, uh, infinity, it will go to zero. So we don't have to worry about that. But because I'm doing something that's closer than infinity, I actually wanted to get as precise as possible. So that 2000 is that where that two meters comes into play. So two meters is 200 centimeters or 2,000 millimeters. That's where that 2,000 comes into play. Now, if we use Wolfram Alpha to solve this, again, the result here is that the optimum focal length is 205.423 uh, millimeters. So the, we have to take into account the flange distance of the camera as well as the bellows extension. So that's what, we, uh, that's what I did. Now, what I did is I actually took the body cap camera, put it on just the body of the camera. That's where we get this sort of first focal length. And then, you know, subsequent additions of extension tubes and the zoom bellows, as well as the zoom bellows plus extension tubes to get a wide variety of, of different focal lengths to test. Now, this has an added consequence. By doing this, keeping the camera at the exact same position, if we're changing the focal length, right, longer focal lengths are, you know, zoom, you know telephoto lenses, right? So we're gonna get a tighter crop of the picture. So not the the angle of view is not going to be the same for every single picture. We're actually going to be essentially zooming in because we have a zoom lens, right, with the, with the bellows extension. So we're not going to get the same crop of all the pictures. Alternatively, what I could do is I could actually move the camera backwards every time to get the same angle of view. That's like very, very complicated, and you're going to get some sort of compression issues when you talk about, you know, camera to, to object distance. So what it is, I kept the same camera in the exact same spot, and we're just going to zoom in. So all the pictures that you're going to see are going to be zoomed in. Now what you're gonna see is as we go along the line and we actually zoom in, we're actually getting clearer and clearer images up until the optimum. But then even after the optimum, it's not really clear that the picture is actually degrading due to diffraction. I was actually really surprised by this. So we start with a, a pretty fuzzy image and it's going to get you know a little bit more and more sharp. But essentially by the, what is this, the, the sixth image? By the sixth image, we should reach the optimum. And after that, you know, there, there are four images after that. They don't necessarily look any worse than what the optimum is. That's why I get this sort of rule of thumb, this notion that if you make the pinhole too small, then it's okay, you know, because the diffraction isn't going to be that bad. Now, again, if you look at the, uh, the exposure times, the added consequence is that you're sitting there for, for minutes and minutes and minutes longer using these longer focal lengths because the f-stop, the aperture size is going to be, you know, much the f number is going to be much, much higher, which results in more light needing to get to the camera. And because of that, you're gonna get these long exposure times. So it's a trade-off between time and resolution, but I don't think you lose that much to diffraction. I was actually very surprised to see this result. So here I have the same sequence of images, just with a 100% tight crop 
of the images so you can see kind of at the, at the pixel level what is going on. Now just to give you an idea of what you can actually achieve with a pinhole, and again, a pinhole is very simple to make. It, I would recommend if you're really doing some critical work, buy a laser etched pinhole. They're not very expensive. They're, you can find them on eBay between $10 and $15 for the pinhole. You can find a body cap for maybe $5. So within $20 and a little bit of effort, you can have something that's you know not going to be lens quality, but you'd be surprised with the results. So here is actually a, at the optimal distance of 205 millimeters, here is the cropped image of what was taken from the film. And then I actually swapped this out for uh, an 80 millimeter lens. And what I did was I cropped it to about the same ratio. Now, of course, the lens at f8 is going to be much, much sharper than what the pinhole can create. But it's, you know, it's really surprising the resolution that you can get. And especially if you have a digital you know, film hybrid workflow where you can apply post-processing. Here is the same picture with Photoshop sharpening. You know, this is just the default Photoshop sh sharpening tool. And essentially, you know, it's going to play with a little bit of the contrast levels to kind of give you that perceived sharpness boost. But, you know, looking side by side, this is amazing for just a small hole in, in a small piece of thin metal versus, you know, an optically designed, very expensive, you know, R&D goes into these lens manufacturers. And, you know, lenses aren't necessarily cheap. So, you know, if you're just starting in, in film photography, especially large format, medium format, these kind of things where the, where the gear can get extremely expensive, you know, pinhole cameras may, may not be a, a bad option. So I hope that was a really cool look and empirical test of actually how all of this math actually works out. And in practice, we do see that, you know, the math makes sense. It really goes to show that photography is one of the best balances between science and art. Yes, it's artistic, it's a creative process, there's a lot of subjectivity, but there's also a lot of objectivity in terms of exposure, in terms of different things, as we saw with the pinhole camera. There's a lot of physics and math that goes into photography. My main motivation for creating this channel is actually to dive deeper into that math that a lot of other people don't seem to talk about. You know, a lot of people, they want to go out and they want to take great pictures, and they want the pictures to look nice, but they don't necessarily have an understanding of the fundamentals and why pictures come out the way they do. So I hope that was a fun look and I hope you learned something this Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day. Maybe it inspired you to go out and take your own pinhole photographs. And again, if you wanna learn the science of photography, I highly encourage you to subscribe to this channel. I have much more educational content coming out soon. And really, when you build off of those fundamental building blocks, your pictures can only get better. So if you haven't done so, please subscribe. And if you like this video, leave a like, leave some comments. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. And as always, until next time, happy photographing.